and I am moderating this what promises to be a super interesting session with um, none other than Georgia Taglietti. Um, obviously you know about Georgia um, and we're going to get into this in a bit. I'm just going to go through some admin stuff. So for everyone who's on the call, um, we very much encourage you to have your cameras on if you would like. We would love to see your faces. Um, but as a precaution, this is being recorded and also it's being, um, it's on Facebook Live as well. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end after the hour session um, and we also encourage you to use the chat uh, so feel free to, to talk in there, talk amongst each other, um, maybe flag something up if you, you have an interest, this is no problem and I think maybe uh, sometimes if I see something I might introduce it into the conversation with Georgia, that's no problem. Um, just to give you a bit of a background about CodeOp, for those of you who don't know, um, we are a tech school based in Barcelona. However, we have students come to us from all over the world and it's been that way from the beginning. Um, it's a tech school with a specific mission. The people that we have coming to our tech school are, um, it's spe specifically for women, uh, transgender and non-binary individuals, um, which I'm sure all of you can agree that this is a super important uh, need um, in terms of the tech space. And so, one of the things that we do, I mean, we do a few things, but the essentially it's boot camps um, for coding and also we do courses. So this is product management as well as data analytics. Um, however, kind of one of the focuses in, in building this type of community and building a school that's so specific um, is to actually ensure that we get as many people from these backgrounds into a tech community. And we show people um, that there is an access and there's a route to tech and there's kind of an expansive space um, in this environment. And this leads us into subversion. So the idea of subversions is that there is so much going on um, in the tech industry that we obviously know about that we're presented with in, in the media but again there's so much stuff going on behind the scenes um, that's super important that is silently game-changing that has some of the most interesting people working in um, that is actually you know this term disruption has been used a lot um, in the tech industry but I kind of see these things as truly disruptive it's people who um, maybe aren't reflected in the every day to day but they're people who um, are part of the world and are part of the world that um, tech is shaping and so we wanted to bring kind of these voices that are working on the margins of tech um, highlight the projects and the people who are working within them and so we're running the series the first one um, that we did was a few weeks ago this one is music. We have the next one coming up, which involves wine, um, which is with a freelance sommelier. Her name is Nika Shavela. She works uh, in Barcelona and kind of all around the world. Um, and she'll be talking about how kind of wine and tech work together, how uh, tech is influencing wine. Um, and in this session, obviously, we're talking about music. Now, music has, I mean, tech, is, tech and music go side by side, and they have for a very long time. Um, however, Georgia has been working in the industry for for, I think since 1995, I mean, at least that I know she was working with Sonar since 1995. She's currently the head of comms um, at Sonar, and she also is the local director of She Said So, which is a curated community of women who are actively in music. So she is the Barcelona um, lead on this, and she also teaches um, and lectures. So there's a lot that is going on in her profile. Um, and so I'm going to begin, Georgia, with um, actually you doing your own introduction, because um, you're going to do it so much better than me. And also just in terms of introducing yourself, um, then we can move on to how you started this journey. I'm sure when you were, maybe you were younger, you didn't expect yourself to, to go into this route or you know, maybe you always loved music, but just some background on how you kind of ended up where you are at the moment. Thank you for your intro, actually, because I think it's been amazing so far. And thank you for the honor to be around uh, such a beautiful group of people that actually working towards something that is very close to my heart. Um, I am the head of COM at Sona Festival, which is an electronic music festival founded by uh, three directors in 94. I have been correctly working with them since uh, 95, never worked in music before, but I was born and bred and raised by a man that loved jazz and was a jazz collectionist. So my heart um, goes back to a lot of uh, jazz in the 50s and the 40s. I was raised with that. Uh, I think actually that it's very important to highlight that because I found after so many years in electronic music, uh, not only that electronic music has a kind of natural liaison with tech, it's, it's profoundly a tech base, but that jazz uh, in all the evolution that I had in the 20th century, 
was the beginning of electronic music in lots of ways. I mean, actually, it's very interesting the debates that we have now about electronic music that can mirror um, the debates that uh, back in the 70s, and especially in the 70s, uh, was, was concerning jazz. And I think it's, it's a very interesting um, background that I feel sometimes that a kind of crossover in my mind in lots of ways. You know, I was a collectionist for a long time. I was really obsessed with that. So I read about a lot of things and I think it, it made my life more complete to come from a jazz background uh, the way I was really into it. Not like, a, oh, I'm listening to Miles Davis and that's cute or that's nice. You know, I was really into understanding the process and the life and the social background of jazz music. So I think that is a bit of a, my personal background with music comes definitely with jazz. And uh, my work background with electronica comes from the fact that, that before working in music, before 95, I was like um, actually working with, um, uh, strangely enough, with uh, Macintosh. The beginning of it uh, was Macintosh. And it was, um, I had my first computer was a LC4. Uh, it cost a fortune and uh, my dad bought it for me in order for me to kind of uh, be able to um, use it. I fell in love with the Mac Classic in a studio design when I was working. Uh, and then I became what at the time was a computer assisted design with Illustrator and Photoshop and, and, uh, and Macintosh. I did an interview that was really funny at some point which was like, uh, I did an interview in Ibiza for a newspaper and I'm sure you can find it online. And I said that in my house, they call me the illegitimate uh, daughter of Steve Jobs, uh, which is a very funny, funny thing that came out of, because my, 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 my brother called me that way. You know, we spent a lot of money into Steve Jobs in the beginning when Mac was really, really expensive. And my, my brother said, you, you should be the daughter of Steve Jobs, which back to the thing in between jazz and, and Max, I think you can already see my kind of pre-preparation for this chat with you, Ajiro, <laughs> which is about music and technology in a way, because it's, uh, it's definitely my, my, my story. It's definitely my story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when you talk about your, I mean, just going back to what you were saying, because I, I thought it was quite interesting. Um, you're talking about having this Macintosh when you were a young age. Was this something that you actually specifically wanted? Or was this something that came from your father thinking, actually, no, I can no, no. see that this is no, this is something that you wanted yourself? I mean, my father didn't. I mean, my father comes from northern Italy. I uh, I come from a, you know, well-off northern Italian family, very machist and very traditional. And uh, I left when I was 18 to go and study to Barcelona. And in Barcelona, I, I met and I learned about life in general. And I traveled a lot, went to London. And then I, in this design studio specifically, they bought a Mac Classic. And for me, and nobody could use it. And for me, it was just just the toy, just the dream. And I was like, this is amazing. This is fantastic. This is great. And we were doing packaging. So I use it for packaging. I used to do, you know, all the types and all the layouts and, and nobody could use it but me that I was at the door as a secretary. Wow. So it's like, that was kind of my first jump. And then I said, I can do stuff with that. You know, I can be paid to do that. Mm. And, um, and then I became a lot of, a, I became a, quite a freak of Macintosh at the time. And, you know, for me, Macintosh, as we all know, has a system that is very uh, comprehensive and it's very easy to understand since the beginning. So for me, it was just like perfect. And since then, I have to say that I have been following Apple, but I know that I have a, with, with languages and, and computers, I have a kind of good way to go. And machines. I love machines. I think machines, they have this kind of, uh, they respond to humans because they're made by humans. So I have a very good relationship with machines too. I mean, I'm talking in a tech webinar, so I can confess myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And I know before, before getting on this call, um, which some of you will, I mean, you'll hear about this later. I'm going to touch back on that topic of Georgia and her connection um, to tech because it's very, very strong and there's a very um, significant points that she makes about this. Um, but let's just, just tracing the journey. So um, obviously you're the only person now in this office from secretary to kind of this whiz kid with um, this software and you're using Mac. How did that, how did you transition from, from doing this? Obviously, I mean, you saw the potential in computers from a very young age. How did that transition then from kind of working on design and doing these things to going into electronic music at, at an early stage in terms of building this, this sonar image? I didn't want to go to, to work in music at all, actually. That was mm -hmm. my, my dichotomy that I still have. I mean, when you work in music, you don't enjoy music, unfortunately. Because most of the time you think, oh, you have a lot of time to listen to a lot of stuff. You're given a lot of music. You're given a lot of stuff, but literally you're working. So, you know, I can't work with music on. So that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you work hard, music has no time boundaries, time limit. You start when you start and you don't know where it ends. So, you know, uh, I knew already that working in music would have been challenging uh, for me in order to renounce to the pleasure of the audiophile and branch, branching into the workaholic music background. Um, so that wasn't an easy jump to do for me. It was easy in a way because I started at Sona because I had my computer. Actually, the whole story is I had my computer. They needed an assistant design for the designer that was doing the first catalog, well, second catalog for 95. And I was really good in, in mise en page, in, in, in doing the page maker kind of thing. And, uh, and they called me through a friend. And then we met and we were squat. I mean, literally in 95, we were squatting in a place and we were all together and talking about what do you like and who do you, you know, and I was clubbing and I love music and I love jazz and they love jazz and some of them were composers. So it was like, what very natural environment for me to be with. But I never thought that I was kind of jumping into becoming uh, uh, working in music. And I did, which, you know, mythomaniacally being, it's really good. You know, I met a lot of musicians. I never thought I would, I would share the stage or backstage or whatever with people that I really love. But at the same time, you do it as a job. And I think it's important to demystify this kind of thing about, oh my God, she's working in music, she's working with these people. And you're like, well, it's a very hard work, especially for me as a woman. I started when I was 30. Um, I started also being in charge of bookings. Uh, I work a lot in bookings with Detroit Techno, not an easy thing to do. Um, so I did a lot in the music business and I know how hard it is. So it's very important. And then by by that, I wanted to link it with technology. Then when technology became essential for a workforce is when my work become easier. And that's why I depend so much on, on being positive about the, 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 the innovations in technology in the workplace. Because for me, in terms of being working with music in different countries, with, with my... Uh, task which was promoting internationally working in bookings um, when technology became present by meaning having computers that were not super expensive by meaning that beyond fax and telex we had email uh, you finally reach the point in which you connect with all the world and then your job becomes easier mm -hmm. okay so like you're saying you're somebody who is a, a a tech -afar. I'm actually not sure what the term is for this, but you're somebody who really loves tech and you're talking about how, um, and we're talking specifically about your job now, not about how it influenced music, but how it, it made your job a lot better. Um, did you find that working within, you working within your realm, um, that there were some people who were more um, adverse to, to tech coming in? Did you find that there were anyone, anyone you were working with who actually preferred not to use so much tech? Did you have to be somebody who was an early adopter uh, in your industry? <laughs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> Basically, because um, still now, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and still now for women of my age, I'm 54. Uh, there is a block uh, of my generation and that's uh, terrible. I'm always speaking against it. The fact that uh, women of my age, possibly mothers, 
kind of have this kind of rejection or personal rejection or block blockage or a sense of rejecting tech in a way, which is something I really fight against, especially because tech is not something you can fight against or reject. It's something that needs to be uh, within your, within your uh, life. It's like cooking or it's like, uh, I don't know, you know, I'm a big fan of the fact that internet needs to be like electricity comes naturally in the house because that's how we are that's how we live and I find myself and I always find myself um, I'm very quick in learning actually I want to do your product your product developer product manager course I didn't say to you but I found it amazing and there's I'm sure there's half of the course I need to specify on because I, it's beautiful how it's presented but you know always to be a tech uh, a person that really loves tech and really loves future because that's important to see into the future you need to be flexible and that's what tech is about being flexible on nodes and uh, knowing and learning and moving and and clicking which is something that is natural with for me and people lots of people of my age completely my age don't want to get into it which i think it's a it's a it's a very wrong positioning uh, towards the evolution of the human race even you know uh, i think tech also uh, has taught me a lot about myself and about the world in general mm -hmm. and uh, whatever the expansion uh, and the scientific expansion of this world will be so i'm not scared i actually love it to embrace it in a very natural way okay so having worked like we said, um, for 25 years um, within this, this area, um, within this festival electronic music, within this expanse of kind of the music industry, what are, I mean, there's going to be, this is an expansive topic, there's going to be many things. What do you think are some of the top things that you've, you've seen tech bring um, into this space? And what are the things that you, you project it's, it's going to do? And we're focusing on the positive element now, because you're somebody who is very positive about this. Well, uh, I think there has been ten, almost 10 years lost. The last 10 years has been lost, uh, blocked by corporations, by costs, by money, by, um, by actually the access, because it looks like we have, ha even the artist and the musician, I'm talking also towards music, we've been talking about uh, virtual reality, uh, worldwide collaboration online for a long time now, such a long time that I'm quite bored about it. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, we've been talking about all these big words without really, because I've met a lot of, a lot of artists, a lot of people that are working in this field, especially through our Congress on a plus D. And uh, it's been 10 years of boredom, really, literally people working towards discoveries and new stuff and not having access to it, not having money to access the real things. And uh, the, by real things saying, uh, democratizing the access to real technology is so important because you have all these creators that want to access stuff that is linked to, you know, whatever big corporation or institutions are, but they don't have access to it. So, you know, there's still a lot of um, different levels of how we speak about technology, which is unfair because uh, technologists not necessarily are the big minds, but, you know, we have experienced the hacking lately of uh, this guy that was super young, and you know that exactly how the new generations have technology in their blood, in their DNA. And uh, instead of reacting towards it, we don't embrace it. One of the biggest points here for me is education. Uh, you don't get an education in technology. You don't go to school and say, oh my God, this is technology. This is how technology has been applied in the past. This is the story of technology. This is how you get there, why you have a mobile, what's the mobile for, who is the creator of it, what's the purpose and objective of it. 
sociologically, ethically, worldwide. There's no such thing as technology studies when you are eight, which I think it's horrible because, you know, they want to know, they know what they have in, in, in the hand. They find it really easy and really funny, but they don't understand the scope of it in a major scenario. And uh, I teach a lot. And that's why, you know, I think that teaching is a very important thing to understand that the generation that is 20 to 30, you ask them the backstage of what they use in terms of technology and they have no clue. Some of them, they don't know how the algorithm works. Some of them, which is a major thing to understand, you know, when you talk about privacy, if you don't know how an algorithm work, you can't talk about privacy because the algorithm is the one that is mastering what you see, what, how you do, how you move, how you perceive the word, and you need to master the algorithm. So that's one of the first class that we do when you are 10. So it's like, you know, it, that's, there's a lot of gaps in the conception of technology. There's a lot of gaps into the, into the knowledge of what technology is. We, you know, it's, it's a really, we, we shall start from the beginning and then going into further more. Uh, but if you don't have the roots, you don't understand why you're using it and you use it for your own pleasure, thinking that it's funny and then complaining that it's using your IDs and uh, there's a lot. But, you know, you need to understand or you, you need to use everything that I was. I was taught philosophy and history and geography and everything. And now they don't think that technology is something to be taught, at, which I think it's so important is like where does technology come from and where it goes is, 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 should be something obligatory for everyone. Yeah. So on this point, actually, um, so I find at the moment, I mean, I find this, this kind of uh, debate quite interesting. Um, so speaking of technology, for example, the fact that, and you're saying this, people who are young are just complete natives um, to it. I mean, they, they go up, they have a phone in their hand from a very young time, um, from a very young age, and you can see certain things happening, like, for example, in, um, I mean, you saw certain things happening with SoundCloud coming into the market and this allowing people to actually be able to make music um, in their homes and make music easy and actually, you know, send this out into the world. Um, but with things like SoundCloud, with the possibility of people even be able, being able to make music on their phones, for example, now, which people can, can do actively out on the street. Um, I know there are a lot of people also who do the opposite. And it's like you're saying, people who maybe don't understand technology or um, they're maybe purists about certain things. They don't like certain things that come from SoundCloud. They think, you know, there shouldn't be all of these people going through SoundCloud or people making music on their phones uh, and this type of thing. Um, do you think that's a debate about uh, like the purism of music? Um, or do you think that ties into like what you're saying, people being kind of uh, not understanding technology. So thinking that nothing good can come from these, these uh, devices that people are using or this, this new approach that we're taking to, towards music. It's ignorance. I mean, okay. we, I've been working with uh, artists doing music from computers and sharing music from computers from 95 onwards mm -hmm. and um and i've seen the how they uh were sharing it anyway uh you know the the cost of it was different but the the way we they used to do it was practically the same i think that the highlight of uh, platforms like uh, Bandcamp or, uh, well, Bandcamp in the face because I'm, I'm really fan of the, I'm a big fan of how they're doing right now and how they're supporting artists. And, uh, but, you know, all the platforms that are for stream actually haven't really yet found uh, a way to just not be a platform. And I think that in the next months or maybe year, uh, all of them will need to think about not just being a platform because being a platform costs nothing. It's a bit being Facebook. It costs, you know, servers and persons and algorithms and blah, blah, blah. But uh, you are just a vehicle in which people create the content and create everything, which I find it very passive in a way. Uh, I love the fact that you can become like the cinema people have done producers or intervene and giving money back to the artist in order to create 
uh, you know, I always said that I would have loved to see uh, SoundCloud, Spotify, or any streaming platform to become a label and push for new artists instead of push for whatever. And we don't want to name names, but you know, the fact that, uh, like Daniel X say two days ago or a week ago, that you can't just create one album every four years is, is, is unsustainable that somebody like in his position and in his place say something like this to artists that have serious problems in producing albums and, and get money out of it. And, um, you know, I think that the, the music business is right now because of the live non being there, uh, sitting down and thinking, because there will be a huge upheaval of people looking for a way to be artists and sustain themselves. And the way it should be is that all these streaming platforms, all this way to distribute contents should give back to the, to the community uh, with programs, with, uh, you know, I'm not saying how, I'm saying conceptually, I think that the streaming platforms need to give back. Basically for a structure that is very simple, I bought myself the same, the same music in four different supports in my lifetime. You know, I bought jazz in a CD, in a cassette, in a vinyl and in a streaming platform. Meaning my money, not the youngsters' money, but my money has been going around the labels and the copyrights and the neighboring rights for so long for the same track or the same album. That's something that sometimes nobody thinks, but it's really applicable to the streaming scenario. It's very good for the new generation. It's very good for me. It's very easy and handy, but I have all my CDs there. I have all my cassettes there. I have all my vinyls there. And actually, if you want to go back to analogic, you can go back to analogic. And people that complain about things like, oh, this is not the purest way. Well, you know, play your vinyls at home and be happy with the Denon and that's fine. But, you know, I think it's not a question about how it sounds or how it does. It's, it's a question that the streaming platforms are really a kind of box of it. It's something that puts you out there, the content, and they, of course, uh, create the algorithm. So you don't have the real discovery. You have what the algorithm discovers for you. So I think that, you know, for me, technology is, uh, is at my use. It's not technology dominates me. It's like I have technology and I decide what to watch, what to see, what to hear, dig into it, non dig into it. It's not that technology rules my word. I rule my word with technology, which is a completely different position than most of the people right now. They just play their songs and look at their playlist and, and, and just don't care about whatever else is happening around them. Mm -hmm. you know. And I think the fact that now lots of game platforms like Twitch and Discord and um, you know, are, are playing games with music is because music is trying to find different ways to perform. And it's a very interesting way to become aware that I saw a performance via Minecraft, um, which is like, why now? It, you could have done a performance within Minecraft like maybe five years ago, but it's like now it's becoming necessary. And so everybody's kind of escaping where the virtual realities are again which is not new there's nothing that i'm saying that is completely revolutionary is the opposite but i think that's that's the next scenario the next scenario is the one that can the changes or slight changes or good changes that that the streaming platforms and the and the technology can offer to the artist in order to reach an audience that is willing to pay for it, which is a very important thing. Absolutely. Okay, so now I'm going to switch slightly, but I'm going to stay on the idea of support and change um, because I want to talk about uh, She Said So, um, yes. which is an actual international um, organization. Like we said, you're the, the local director of the Barcelona chapter. Um, so, I mean, I this is maybe a personal thing, but I sometimes think that um, music is overlooked in terms of diversity. I think people see so much and they're exposed to so much that they actually think it's 
a very diverse thing and maybe there aren't as many issues as they believe in there they're not un they're completely unaware of kind of the history how music how one form of music has informed another and this type of thing so in terms of she said so maybe some people would think oh it's it's interesting to have a, a woman's group like within music um but for you what was so important in kind of joining she said so and and what is your outlook and and what do you try to kind of bring to this community in in terms of uh yeah growing it what's important for women's voices in the music industry? The values, of course. Uh, I think that after I joined almost the second month or the first month that was created by Andrea Magdalena in LA, uh, which I consider my spiritual daughter. Uh, she is a Romanian woman, very tech, somebody, that um, has created this while working at Mixcloud in London and then went to LA, married in LA, and now uh, he's the pulls the strings from LA for the general group. I wouldn't think that now we are on, women only. We are actually very much uh, representing uh, everything that is not what I would say uh, a man, <laughs> like 40 years. <laughs> 40 years old white man <laughs> everything outside of it we did here but it's like um we want to be as inclusive as possible since the beginning that's why i said when we said women i don't want to exclude everybody that is participating actively in the creation and in the, the diversity of the platform which is very important for us and um she said so for me was I was lost. I was finding my way through maybe mentoring. I, I work in a very male environment, very accustomed to work with the male environment. So when you get accustomed, you get like accustomed. You don't think out of the box anymore. So I got bored and I was like, mm, this is not my thing anymore. And how do I get out without getting out of the job, which is a very good job. And, uh, and then I, uh, one of my closest friends in London, she was uh, actually two of my closest friends in London. We were sitting down. They said, there is this woman doing this platform. Do you want to talk to her? And so we spoke and uh, I got a bit of as a mentor because of course I was the older one. I still think I'm the older one. And uh, I was like getting involved with her and uh, I kind of, become a bit of an international spot person for it and then I created the Barcelona one but then I feel very very much linked to all the chapters we have chapters all over the world right now we are more than something like 12,000 people connected and 5,000 people on on the Google uh, group that now is becoming an app and a platform uh, it's been a long journey uh, it's a pro bono work we we work without getting paid it's for the sake of the visibility of everything that is not a 40 years white man in the business and um there's a lot of things that i'm proud of about this uh we've done a meeting in portugal in october past year and i cried a lot because i think that it's it's uh, such a very strong moment when you see people you've been connected to for a long time uh six years now um uh, like it's it's very intense you know where the values are where the ethics are uh we're part of the conversation um we feel proud of of being there and being together and uh you know i feel there's a kind of as any network because uh, i don't think it's a it's just a priority in, in she said so there's any network right now i shall invite everybody to be parts of networks that are close to your hearts because any network is actually a net to protect from the crisis and the covid crisis especially uh because of the exchange of knowledge the human touch uh the possibility of reach out in order to get contacts out there feeling that you're part of a of a community uh, digital or non-digital, I don't care, but feeling that you're part of a community uh, makes you feel that you're part of something bigger than anything that is happening in the world. Absolutely. Um, so, kind of still around uh, She Said So, um, 
and the diversity issue. So, I mean, like you said, you're trying to move away from anything that is not um, 40 year old white man. Um, this is again, a bit of a broader question, but do you feel like the industry is, is moving more towards something that looks like this? Do you think that uh, kind of a, a change is happening? Um, do you still think there's quite a lot of fighting to do? Uh, do you think visibility is something that is, is talked about and expressed more in the industry? Um, and if not, do you have any like ideas as to how you think there should be a change or, or what should change? Who is changing things maybe, for example, that you can point people to? Well, there's uh, two things that are around right now. There's guilt and fear. So guilt to be, to have done something in the past that you, you were unaware of or said or done or shared. And the contextualization of guilt uh, in this sense uh, needs to be reevaluated within the context you were working on. Maybe, yes, you are guilty and you want to reframe or maybe not because it's not that strange and it's not that painful and needs to be refrained anyway, but there are different levels of guilt uh, because of the ignorance of uh, the, the context back then. I mean, yeah, 10 years ago was awful. And, uh, and now I live in a world that is very much paradise because of she said, so, you know, I know a lot of women and I move around very easily. I know where the women are. I identify them, uh, women or no women, sorry, just, uh, non white men, but, uh, and I can put a lot of people within that. Uh, I don't want just to focus on gender, but I also want to focus on race and I want to focus on a lot of things. That's why I'm using that icon. And I love a lot of 40 years white men, but it's like the icon of what we are not talking about. And uh, I think, yes, uh, techno has always been very white and very male. Uh, there's few things that you can change about that. I think it's uh, something that you always need to think of because the generation of techno is black and American. Uh, but it became white and male. Uh, well, it's always been male though. Uh, but the, the whiteness of it has been really, really, really difficult to change in the last years or so. The festival goers are very much white. Um, I don't know if you experimented that, but I experimented this even in London. You know, the only place I really felt, felt diversity was uh, Notting Hill Carnival. And uh, that was the first time for me that I felt that everything I had in, on my stage, because it was, we'd never been really at all, uh, you know, we had any race, any type of gender on stage at Sonar, and I'm really proud of that. But at the same time, I knew the public was becoming some kind of bubble. And when I went to Notting Hill Carnival, with all the DJs that I knew and everybody playing, I felt the diversity in a very kind of deep way, very deep way. And I felt that was fantastic to see how you would have enjoyed these rhythms and this music around diversity in, in lots of ways. Um, at least this is my personal experience. And I think, you know, right now, uh, the, 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 the fact that everybody's uh, uh, highlighting the lack of diversity in all themes, sexual and racial, in music, um, it's important because it's always puts the spot on it. The thing is, for instance, when you get into a lot of causes, you lose which cause you want to play with. And I've been literally a bit worried about these causes all one in one, you know, the women, uh, the racial, uh, the anti-Semitic, uh, you know, it all comes in one thing and at some point will become a movement that needs to englobe everything because if not, in, it looks like I'm playing with this game, but I'm not playing with this game and I'm playing with that and I'm not supporting that. And you feel guilty all the time and you're like, hmm. So, and now, and especially being like I am, white 54 woman in Europe, you feel, am I missing some cultural gap? Am I missing some, uh, you know, 
not really with the sexual a gender gender i that's not really what i'm feeling but on the racial side yes because you know you feel that we've been kind of ghettoing in a way getting separated more and more even if it looks like we are a democracy and it's bigger and stuff it's like no and when you go to italy you see it more and more and um and when you well here it's a bit neutral but i think yes i felt this kind of lack of diversity in the music industry in talking to people in a professional way and i think it's very important when you open it up to feel how other people are feeling towards it you know what i mean it's like i can't really i just read a lot right now i just read a lot in order to understand how the other people are feeling and that's why we're going back to the jazz period because i read one of the best books was billy holiday autobiography uh lady sings the blues and um when you read these books uh your your and you read biographies of Coltrane, you get into Blue Note, and you get on these real things uh, about them. Uh, it, it looks like we're going back then, again. You know, they were complaining about the white audience in Europe. They were complaining about making money in Europe but not being uh, recognized. They were complaining about, uh, even in the 80s and 90s, the people in Detroit, nobody knew them in Detroit. You know, they were part of a, segment that was so everything is niched so one of the things that i think we are processing me i'm processing as white person is how this can de-niche itself and become you know equalized in a way so i can read or watch or hear or listen or share my experience in a balanced way with any gender or any race at the same time mm -hmm. and this is what i think you know we've seen that technology is profoundly biased and so we also need technology to be de-biased to help us reach this kind of knowledge you know what i mean it's like one of the things that i always teach was like mm, why is cortana named cortana and why siri named siri and why all these voices are girls at least in the first place are we all the secretaries of the world? And this is where we'll be, like in 90s, 50s. So, you know, the bias is there, simple or more complex, but it's there. So what, we, what you are doing, what we are doing is, is uh, fighting the bias, even within the algorithm. And that's, that's in a tech participation or tech discussion we are having. I think it's very important to fight the bias of the algorithm because it's very much biased. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, so there's, there's quite a lot of stuff building um, in terms of feminizing the internet, which I find really interesting. Um, like you have groups who, for example, are interrupting, um, sorry, disrupting uh, like wiki pages and things. So people who are going in and having hackathons, uh, making sure that Wikipedia information is actually reflecting the right thing. I went to a talk um, a couple of years ago and somebody talked about a day where they um, got people from all around the world to um, look for secretary and try and disrupt the Google algorithm. So of they course. would click on secretary, they'd find a picture of a man um, and click on that to try and change uh, that image. So I mean, like you're saying, exactly. So it's um, interesting that you're saying that this is something that needs to happen everywhere and especially in, in music moving forward. Um, so obviously you're somebody who, who has many thoughts, many ideas, um, many things that you want to kind of impart to people. And like you said, though, it's very difficult if you're, I mean, you have your own causes and your own battles and you want to make sure that you're supporting um, other people as much as possible. Uh, when you, so when you teach, when you come across your students and you're trying to, to give them this information to go forward with, with the right ethics and values, what do you find is the most important, the most important thing in teaching them about kind of tech and, uh, and also diversity going into music? What do you try and impart mostly to them? Surprising them with the no knowledge that they have and feel that they recover the curiosity. I'm normally when I teach them, I want to discover what their gaps are and, uh, and play. I'm very, I'm a quite a playful person. So uh, I use kind of the gaming techniques to kind of uh, involve them. I have this typical code, which is define yourself with three hashtags 
with everybody gets in crisis with. And I, I laugh about it because um, it's very important actually when you do a selfie of yourself, uh, whatever, through whatever TikToks or Instagram or whatever, you always add hashtags and, um, and they don't know what an hashtag is. You know, they know, but they don't know really what's the meaning of an hashtag. And, uh, and that's why I use hashtags to play with them. I use, I use things that are very kind of simple, but if you ask them what they are, they don't know. Um, like, you know, I start normally a class by saying, especially about social media and the correct use of social media and technology and stuff is like, do you know that, you know, what you see in your feed is not chronological and, you know, lots of people in the class don't know it, never, never checked if it's chronological or not. And you're like, well, this is the main thing about the social media thing. The main revolution about fake news is the non-chronological algorithm. And it's a very important thing to teach. You know, it's like, if you don't understand it, then you will see something that is happening and it's not happening. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, the disruption of time online is also something that I teach a lot. And uh, in music, uh, the importance of discovery. And I tell you what, lots of people think that music is easy to access, which is fine. But they don't think it's easy to produce. So the impromptu jam of music is lost. You know, that's why we all love the live music setting because the live music setting offers you the opportunity to listen to something that nobody will listen to ever again because it's a reproduction live that's something that is completely out of the heart and the person. So the rediscovery of the music human humanization of music it's something also very important the fact that you do music with your own body that you don't only use computer uh i have a very good example um i work with uh mentoring for factory berlin and i was working with women in tech uh group really amazing girls and they presented me this installation and this amazing thing and uh, and in sudden say what is the music and one of them said, oh, my God, I'm a musician and I, forget, I forgot to work on the music. I was so focused on technology and on the tech and how it works and how it worked, the installation, that I forgot about the soul of it. So I always think that music is, as the arts, are actually the soul of technology. That's why we work with Sona Plus D in, in, and also myself. I do believe that technology without arts is not the technology we are accustomed to. It's everything is about a creator. Everything is about somebody that is a story to tell. So recovering the primitive and the, te- the primitive and the future is something that I'm really thinking a lot of and never losing the point in which you are connected to. That's why I'm connected to my computer, but I'm also connected to my computer the way I could be connected to my book or to my Moleskin or to my writing or to my, or to my singing, you know, it's, it's, it's a way to introduce this as an organic part of it without feeling that it's technology there and my body here and there's something different or in between, you know, my online and offline work life, it's very balanced. And I am trying to teach my students to live a very healthy and balanced online and offline life through technology also. Okay. Um, another thing that I want to, to bring up, again, this is what we talked about earlier. Um, so we, we talk about, we've been talking about young people and, and how to teach them and support them. Um, however, there are, there's the opposite side of that, which are older people, like you were saying, you're considered to be maybe an older person in the industry. Um, oh, yeah. How do you interact with me? So you, you can go into these groups and you can teach and support these um, these young people who are coming up and kind of show them what they're missing but how do you interact in terms of this positivity that you have with with tech with older people who maybe um there's a bit more friction what is it that you how do you approach those situations by scolding them (laughs) you know i call myself the techno granny that's my second name i'm the techno granny and the not only for technology but actually for techno as a music but uh, at the same time i think that i don't let my friends and people around me 
being uh, lazy about that. You know, it's like a trainer. You are in sports and you find people that don't do nothing and you get into like, oh, you should do something and you should train that and I can give you this 15 minutes to train. You should do, you know, you should move your body. It's exactly the same. So it's like you go into somebody that says, oh my God, no, you know. And I said to them, especially towards the children, it's like, you know, you're raising children that are no more than you do, which is very strange. It's very strange that you realize that you don't know what your kid is looking into or what he's doing. And um, I personally feel it very shameful, actually. And uh, I personally think that it's, uh, you know, people think, well, but I'm helping with the homework. And it's like, well, the biggest homework right now that you could do is, uh, is know what your kid is looking at and know what your kid could do in a positive way also with technology, uh, be involved with it. And one day passing by in Barcelona, I found a place where uh, just near my gym saying uh, we take, it's a company that takes care of privacy and builds firewalls about parents and kids. And it, I'm sure it makes a lot of money, but it's, it's the easiest way to go, no? Having somebody that takes care of it instead of you turning into that. And, you know, I think that COVID has changed this because necessity has created the necessity of uh, older generation to become aware of, um, of technology, of becoming aware of not technology, because for us, I mean, girls and guys and in between, this is not technology. A computer is the easiest technology we can have. You know what I mean? It's like, Technology is much more than that. But on the other side of it, how to properly use what technology has offered you in a day-to-day -day basis, it's an obligation. It's like somebody asking me how to plug this or how to put the light on. You're like, hey, this is becoming everyday life. So the way you, there's a fantastic word, just to have a laugh in between us, uh, in Downton Abbey, um, there is the granny that appear and finally they have electricity in the room. And she said, what is this? Take it off. It's going to kill us all. And that's how electricity was uh, perceived. And it's true uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and then, you know, knowledge came around and everyday life came around. So it's like the perception of everyday technology in your life it's very important and the knowledge of it is an obligation. And I'm sorry if I sound like a priest, but I feel like I really need to kind of uh, always say that. And I'm really intransigent. I'm really not, you know, everybody that says, yeah, but I don't have time. And it's like, no, it's like, I'm really like a sport trainer. You like, you always find the time for the things that really are an obligation for your kids, for yourself, and, you, and also for your survival in a world that right now it's more online than offline even. You know, if you balance the world right now, we're probably 65, 70% online and 30% offline, at least in my house. So it's like, this is how you perceive life and this is how you don't, you, you, you don't, you know, you just assume it in a very normal way. Super interesting. I'm so slight and slightly scary. Um, okay, so my second to last question for you is we've talked about this amazing journey, um, getting a Macintosh being a super early adopter, basically, oh, yeah. um, in Italy and Brescia. Um, I want to now look to the future. So now Georgia, going forward, I mean, we have one thing, like you talked about, product management, and maybe this is something that's super interesting for you. Where do you see um, yourself moving in terms of maybe staying in music, maybe not, but your journey into the future in the realm of tech um, or outside of it, where do you, what is it that you're interested in still discovering, learning, knowing, where do you see yourself going forward for the next few years? The nonprofit organizations with a lot of lack of technology applications. Uh, I think that um, that's one of the things that I really feel close to my heart. 
um, technology can be very helpful for nonprofits uh, to be more effective and less expensive and less, you know, and money would be spent in other ways that are not in the technology realm. So um, I think this is one of the things that is very close. It's not easy because uh, nonprofits are very, very much structured and very much layered, but it's something that I would love to do in the future. Another thing that I am already doing is studying uh, copyright and publishing and getting more acquainted to uh, author's right um, uh, because it's very important and it will change a lot in the future, especially music. Um, and uh, technology-wise, uh, I would be very happy if they give me something that is not a mobile and uh, that simply needs, you know, I, I think mobiles are so old fashioned and at some point we will need to have something portable easy quicker that gets us into a different level uh that at least for my life it would be easier uh, for my online and offline life uh so i'm quite a cyborg in this sense i'm really you know i i actually like to think that uh we will become portable technologies that at some point but you know, I'm, I'm open to what comes next, but it's true that priorities in the next two years or so, let's say how it, 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 it will evidently be about uh, helping others and, uh, and uh, nonprofit uh, on all levels. Uh, so I would love actually to be able to, uh, to reset, uh, you know, especially comms, because I think that everything related to comms and COVID has been wrong. Uh, you know, people just don't know how to do the stats, do the maths, communicate about numbers. They're very lost. And I think communication now is becoming even more and more essential. And this is my forte and is what I do best. And I think, you know, I have still a lot to offer uh, to the world in terms of helping others in any country, but especially others in, in such a very difficult time. Okay. And now my very last thing that I'm going to do, and then we're going to go to questions. So please feel free to unmute your mics and um, ask Georgia anything. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot and do you will ask you what you ask your students. So if you could describe yourself in three hashtags, what would they be? Techie, dynamic and flexible. Okay, cool. Yep, I agree. <laughs> okay, I thank you. Sorry. I have a few doubts about me. Uh, that's the thing. I don't doubt that much, but I would like, I think that that exercise is very important even for you or for anybody to kind of avoid doubting in case of, uh, in case of defining yourself in front of others or yourself. And I think that um, the less you, this, your story can always be summed up by three elements at least that are important and then define you like a tag. And, and for me, it's really helpful the way you approach, not only yourself online, uh, to be kind of clear what you want to expand of yourself online. And it helps, you know, for your profiles on LinkedIn, your profiles on Lin your public profiles to people need to be defined, but what you think you are to them. And, uh, and that's very important because that's one of the other things that I teach my students is like, think when your profiles are open to audience and public, you just have an open door. Think what they want, what you want them to see. And that's the very important thing. Okay. So that is our hour. Um, I'm going to hand it over to everyone on the call now for questions for Georgia. Hello, don't be shy. Normally it's very normal to be shy, but you have, what, 15 minutes? No, more. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> really interesting talk, thank you. Um, thank you. Actually a member of She Said So, I've been a member for a few years now, so I'm familiar with the, with the community. Um, it's, 
really interesting to hear you speak about the two kind of key pillars of what we're all striving towards um, being gender equality and racial. Um, but one thing that always leaves me wanting more discussion is the, dis is the, the discussion about class and social mobility within the industry. Um, I'm from the north of England and since maybe my late, ad like my late teens I wanted to break into the music industry and I tried to knock on, on all the doors of the major record labels and it was always really hard because um, it's very London centric and I think it's a common trend across at least Europe, I'm not so sure about the US. And it's kind of difficult, not just from my perspective, but also from an artist's perspective. I'm actually an artist manager and I'm also representing talent from the north of England. And a lot of the opportunities that get passed up are often going to those that are in slightly more financially flexible positions or let's say closer to London. And so I wanted to ask, where do you see the gains to be made in say like a post COVID world where we're now edging towards like remote first working. For example, Sony have just released like a ton of internships and they're allowing the recruitment process to happen solely remotely online. And I thought that was really telling and a really great kind of benchmark of the progress that we could potentially make in terms of extending those opportunities to talent outside of metropolitan areas. Like my question being, what's your opinion of where the discussion could move in terms of like adding class into the equation and social mobility in the industry? Well, more than class is like economically well off or not. I mean, uh, you buy time with money basically. And uh, if you can wait forever and ever, and you have the right friends and they're, you know, uh, how it works. I think that specifically, um, where, where the, in the north of England are you? Oh, sorry, Manchester. Well, in Manchester, for instance, uh, which is a very, uh, I've been there not long ago. And I think it's, um, it's, it's a play. I mean, it could have, being worse than Manchester, you know what I mean? You're from Nottingham or Leeds. I mean, Manchester is pretty good to be from for the music industry. Problem being with Manchester and uh, the rest of the cities up there, I was very close to Nottingham and I'm very close to North, uh, North England for a while uh, in the uh, early 2000s. And I think that actually the centralism of London has been... Uh, very bad for everybody because uh, I mean the fact that all the big money uh, came from private funding and private funds and you know it has become an industry in which either you play the industry that is outside the, the big guys and I say big guys because normally they're big guys uh, which is based is like you know we're talking stock exchange and money and and a completely different game I think that actually the environment of of Bristol, for instance, I've been with the crack guys and, you know, Bristol or Manchester and stuff, it's, it's still quite alive. I mean, though the COVID moment has been terrible, terrible for everybody in terms of money. And uh, I think, of course, this will equalize a lot outside London. Outside London, I think everybody will have a kind of equalization that will become back to talent. Are you talented or not? Because when you're fighting against the waves, you can have all the money in the world and all the class of the world. But right now, not a lot of people will have money and not a lot of people. What they need is talent to imagine, imagine different futures. And I think that talent doesn't come from, you know, class. It comes from talent. Either you have it, either you don't have it. That's why I strongly right now uh, suggest networking and uh, more, you know, masters or anything that lacks in your knowledge 
anything legal or non-legal, anything that can protect you. I think everything that you have time to learn, either via pro bonos, either via paying, there's a lot out there available, um, needs to be, because you need to prepare to show off your talent and counteract the class structure. That anyway, I tell you, I mean, due to the fact that most of the fashion industry will be crashing very soon. And, you know, that was an industry based on class and whatever class or not is going to crash soon. <laughs> so, you know, you have always this thing that you can go through it with a strong will, talent, and the knowledge that now you can get. Technologically speaking, super important. That's why I thought about the product management. And, you know, I really want to know more because I know which are the things that I need. If you don't know about data in the music business, it's wrong because right now data are the ones that are mastering the Spotify lectures, the copyrights issues, the artist thing. So, you know, knowing about data and knowing about analytics doesn't necessarily clash with your talent in music and creativity. It needs to be complemented by that. I'm a data freak. I love data. So when people laugh at me saying, huh, why are you looking at the data? It's like, because you're looking at the people that you're listening to you because you know people through data. And that's how you perceive the public and the audience. And that's how actually the public and the audiences right now in music are treated. They are data. So that's how you need to expand your knowledge in order to be competitive out there when when out there, there will be rehiring. And I think the best way to be competitive again is to, is to introduce more knowledge in technology, more knowledge in everything that can help uh, break the internet <laughs> in a way. You know what I mean? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Julia. Um, so, well, first of all, thank you. It was amazing, um, very you. insightful. And um, I have a question that has to do with uh, di diversifying and representation, because I think like what I see nowadays, and, it, and it's not necessarily bad, but like there's a lot of representation that you can see. So like, for example, photographers now only want diverse models. Uh, fashion only so because the public can see that you know like you can see that these people are you know photographing very diverse people but then the people in charge are still predominantly male and predominantly white mm -hmm. so do you see that happening in the music industry or do you see the music industry going towards representation on both sides you know like di diversifying on both sides uh, I hope. well it's not about only i mean the fact that it the only diverse doesn't exist, first of all. I think that it's all a showing off. We, we see a lot of this in our feeds yeah. uh, and it's a way that algorithm is kind of balancing the guilty, but it's not true. I mean, we're still talking about slight changes in the industries uh, in general uh, and slight changes uh, that doesn't represent a majority or doesn't represent a real balance. What I think it is important is, uh, first of all, to uh, belong to some kind of contextual activism locally. So you really network with people that are activists in this sense locally, not like in the middle of New York, because digital activism is easy, but local activism is complex. And it's where you really see the reality of the situation. If you don't change it at home, don't try to change it in the world. So I think that one of the most important things is to grab your community near you and see if this change has been done, if they perceive it equally like you do. If you don't perceive it equally like you do, what can be done from you? Um, so I think that step by step, we, we all see through internet that everything is a major wave. But really, when you go locally, you realize that that wave can be smaller or stronger or nicer or but that's how you you link or perceive what's the real situation around you uh, one day i wrote a piece after the the attacks in paris i wrote a piece because there was this 
dichotomy in between all my friends, and most of them are journalists or friends in communication, that were saying, why somebody in Spain will, uh, will say, my heart is with Paris, when maybe something happens in Spain and you haven't said that. And I wrote, I was so angry about this fact of guiltinize yourself because you are talking about, it's like us and Beirut right now. What's right? Um, being, uh, you know, being publicly sustaining help with the Beirut or thinking there's a big problem with uh, people not having food in the street just in front of my house. What's the priority there? And ethically, it's a very big dichotomy in your head, like major to microcos microcosm. So Maya was seeing, my way of seeing it, and I'm still very proud of that, that piece because it was like, you get to fight for the things and feel for the things you're close with for your contextual, your culture, your own, your own knowledge, but also your ethics. If your ethics say, I want to fight for this, in, in the case of Sophie was class, um, then I want to see what's going on around me first and how I can not fight or yes, fight, or just push around change around me. Because to be engaged digitally is pretty simple. So we really need to be true to the essence of the causes we want to embrace. And that's why if you think that a photographer a friend of yours is being diverse, you can definitely talk to him about how diverse he feels and how he feels around him and getting a concept of diverse that is different than the one that we all see in a very black and white kind of way because that's how the majority thinks in black and white never grays never in between while now the repositioning of the ethics say what's in between that and what's going on in between that and why we can't be just one in lots of ways which is very difficult but if you do this preach like i do it with my classes or in the petit comité, then you know that there is something changes. If you watch your Instagram algorithm, you will see a lot of posture or, and a lot of things that might be too far away culturally from you. And you need to kind of embrace the fact that you are interested in these causes, but you want to apply them with the neighborhood, I think. Grazie. Di niente, un piacere. Any other question? Oh my God, this is quiet over there. Ejiro, maybe you have. Questions, more questions than I asked. Oh, you always have questions. Katrina, I don't I know why Katrina is not, is not participating in the questions. I have okay. a question. Certainly. I have a question as well. Yeah, Katrina. well, I want, I want, I'd like to give space to um, the audience because I know sometimes it takes a moment of silence to build courage to of ask a question um also i'm monitoring different things and i don't want to screw up that duty but anyways um so you had said that um your expertise resides in comms and i'm so not a communication person that i actually had okay comms what is, what is comms? computers was my first thought no, no, okay. <laughs> also <laughs> <laughs> okay great communications um and um it I would like to know from, I've never talked to um, an expert in communications and obviously knowing something about your track, track record, you've done an incredible job building community through communications. And so can you potentially shed some light into um, what have been some of those successful ingredients um, to someone who knows very little about communications? Well, one of the things, like I said uh, earlier to Ejiro, is uh, the importance of defining who you are or the project is. Um, I can't start communicating about something without knowing exactly what I'm communicating about. So um, that's why I also works very well with my classes in terms of the three hashtags, because then if we have a project, say, uh, working with three hashtags that are concrete, then I can, you know, kind of branch out to a, um, a major, um, a major project or a major plan. But also 
right now communication is mostly about understanding the zeitgeist and communicating with the same words that people want to hear uh, or not uh, depending on the on the positioning that you want to take right now it's it's quite dichotomial it's it's very much a dichotomy there's not much in between as i said uh, there's a lot of haters a lot of lovers there's a lot of you know everything in zeitgeist the zeitgeist of the moment right now is very much uh, polarized and uh, polarized by politics, polarized by um, illness, which uh, frightens all of us, polarized by things we don't understand. So, uh, and we should, uh, but we can't. Um, so I think that the moment and the timing in communication is basically what I think I, and it's literally like music, to tell you the truth, talking about music and technology, um, the moment in time about communicating is like singing. And I remember my dad, uh, I used to sing jazz when I was young, young. And uh, my dad used to tell me, you're always anticipating yourself. You need to slow the tempo. And I was like, really like I was when I was young. I was uh, very much anticipating times all the time. And uh, experience have uh, taught me to breathe, uh, and listen to the tempo. And I think that that's the secret of uh, a good communication. It's about vibing. Uh, I read a lot. I read in the morning and in the night, and I read all kinds of things, from celebrity news to uh, the New York Times. And I read in English, in Italian, in French, and blah, blah, blah. And I think that this gives you... a uh, and you vibe with things that you like. I mean, you can't read it all. And I'm certainly not that type of person. It would be very freaky. But I choose the topics that really reach my mind and I read it. And this kind of builds up my, my way of thinking, okay, this is what people are reading now. This is what I am enjoying. This is what I, this is the temple that is coming in. And, um, Communicating right now is the art of tempo, really. This, uh, it's, it's incredible, but it's not about the wording, which is sometimes, but it's also about the timing. You, you, you need to deliver a message in the right time. You can write a message that is perfect, and if the time is wrong, it's just wrong. And the wording is perfect, the images are perfect, everything is perfect, and it's just wrong. So um, now it's a very strategic moment. I would say less communication and more strategy. Uh, it's a, it's a too loud for things that are not important and less loud for things that will come up uh, certainly on it. For me, like, you know, we are in the middle, unfortunately, but that's how I perceive it. We are in the middle of a tsunami. Then we will need to see how the economy reacts because unfortunately right now the noise is all about economy. But meanwhile, we all know that technology is reacting in very, very interesting and inventive ways. So, you know, I'm pretty much more oriented in checking what is going on with Patreon, with the uh, Twitch with things, with uh, platforms that are opening up, with the disaster that would be if Microsoft buys TikTok and that would be a completely different platform. Um, you know, there'll be a lot of earthquakes coming in for digital platforms and uh, even for Spotify, I think. And uh, it probably will become a video platform, you know, and, and, so we, we will see how everybody reacts in terms of spreading culture and how they communicate about it. Because lately, um, every interview I read and everything happens has always had very strange backlash because people are very polarized. So you never get it right. You never get it right. You could say, sorry, and everybody would say, well, you're sorry because... Uh, and you could say, no, I'm not sorry. And you would be like, oh, well, you should be sorry because... So in a polarized word, everything you say is wrong, basically. So the good thing is say right things in the right moment when it's needed. You know, nobody's doing big launches. Nobody's doing big things uh, that are basically very revolutionary because people, unless it's, you know, 
uh, integrations of Apple, or Zoom or a new computer or whatever, but I'm thinking about big things that might be there for a long time. And, and right now they're just, you know, completely uh, diverging into you know, a different communication plan. So also flexibility is needed. You know, you can say, I'm writing this and you read it. And, and that's what I said with the Giro. I mean, the, the, the rewriting of your story. Some people are actually using this time to rewriting a story that is more correct to, uh, towards others. And I think this is, this is a good path. Is that revisiting the past in order to accept that you've done something and you change it, I think is completely positive in order to kind of make people participating of this rewriting of history through the eyes of the 21st century. I think it's something that is very much deserved by all of us, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I think it's fantastic. So, I, sorry, now you gave me the mic and I'm going to monopolize the space, um, but just a follow-up question then, um, because what I heard from what you just said in terms of um, sort of tapping into the zeitgeist and the rhythms, this sounds like a very intimate, um, intuitive approach to communication. Safe. And um, since we're talking about technology and algorithms, no, um, there are constraints sometimes we have or we're pushed from marketing departments to think about things like SEO, um, to do A-B testing with the content. And of you don't decide, right? It's, it's, you know, the algorithm, it's the statistics, it's the number that say which, which message to go with. And so that, that's a hard thing for me personally um, with the company uh, because sometimes, you know, the test that wins feels really inauthentic. And so how have you balanced um, being ethical and, and pursuing, you know, ha having your communication style laden with your values, but then also looking at the numbers and having to incorporate this? The numbers normally respond well, I have to say. Um, and I'm, you know, I have like, I don't know how many accounts I have of all sorts. But um, the thing is that when you drop the right message, uh, and we're not talking money yet, just like marketing campaigns, but if you drop the right message and the message is in tune, normally organically already, well, right now nothing is organic. But at the same time, I tell you the last month and a half, reach and um, an algorithm has slowed down the, 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 the movement. I mean, we are, lots of people are not investing. So uh, the, the amount of non-investors in Facebook has created a lot of, there's a lot of uh, actually very weird behaviors in terms of uh, algorithms. So uh, actually I think uh, very strange, um, Instagram is very boring right now i don't know if it happens to you all uh, but it's like repetitive uh, in lots of ways but like extremely repetitive um so i'm obliged to go to different accounts and see who's the most less interactive account with me which meaning that the algorithm has less interact with those accounts and then i force the accounts to interact again in order to see if the story changes uh, but it's true that what you said is that ethically, for instance, is like, oh, I'm going out of Facebook. And I always said to people, is like, this is so wrong. You know, it's like, this is the less expensive way to connect on marketing digital. Uh, basically owns WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook. E-commerce is pretty easy to set up. And if you want to sell stuff, go for it. You know, we're not, you know, if we go to the ethics sites, it would be like, oh, where do you have your money? In which banks, which funds you invest? Where, where do you buy your clothes? I mean, the whole thing should be ethical, which is for me right now, though I love it, almost impossible. Then in the ethical part of communication, I go for the easiest, which is uh, going, you need to be involved in the social media and in the, in the discussions in order to know what's going on. And if you go and live in Twitter for a day right now, because it's definitely the most active social media right now, uh, you just mesmerized by the reality 
of these people. And when you feel this and you linger through the media, the classical media, the non-classical media, the imaginary TikToks or Instagrams or Snapchats or whatever, that's what I do. I kind of go through all of it and then take or intake what is interesting for me. Uh, and that's what makes what is called the critical intelligence. I mean, the critical analysis, which is you need to kind of know a bit of everything in order to be a communicator right now, because the gaps can be huge. You know, I, for instance, right now, I source Twitter, I source LinkedIn a lot, which I always loved, but it's incredible because LinkedIn algorithm right now is penalizing me, which I have, 13,000 people uh, connections and, and I get super few kind of interactions compared to the people I'm connected with. So LinkedIn is the new Facebook. It's interesting. The algorithm is always something very interesting. You're like, okay, why are you fighting against me? Who are you? You know, give me a sword. I will find you. Game of Thrones or whatever. It's me against the algorithm. But it's true that you know, there's a really weird behaviors right now because of the lack of money and, you know, algorithm fits with money. So it's very, it's very boring. It's very uninteresting. There's no advertising going on. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting situation right now with, with the, with what do you ask for is, I think the only thing you should be aware of is how far, the selfie moment can go, for instance, you know, uh, if you want to be, if you want to break a thing, you'd normally use a humanization of your company. And that's something that works beyond algorithms. You know, your company can have a logo, can have a super writing, can have a super nice photos, but if you humanize it with persons behind it and with faces, this is what the algorithm likes the most. Hi, my name is Courtney. I have a quick question for you. Of course. Um, I live in the United States. I live in Texas. And um, the coronavirus isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, no. So I, wanna, I wanted to ask you, where do you see um, music festivals continuing um, like the concerts? Because I know a lot of them are moving virtually. And I guess if they're all, if the coronavirus is still going to be like it is, now like next summer do you expect for them all to move virtually and then do you expect for them to be on their own platforms or what what does that look like for you or if you have any opinion on that well first of all it's hard to preview 2021 anyway because <laughs> i think we are not scientists unfortunately and uh we can't believe everything we read. So um, I'm, I'm unable to preview 2021. But in the situation we are in right now, uh, macro events uh, are very difficult to, to, to bring on. So I think that, you know, it's not only affecting how festivals would be, but also how entertaining will be, you know? And I think, Festivals, uh, you know, when, when Sona was born, it was 6,000 people in different scenarios and stuff. And the festival business has been growing and growing and growing and actually has been really blooming. And, and it, it is a very specific experience. But what I, I am more interested the most right now is to see how the cultural experience translate to everybody, not only people that go to festival, but also cinemas or theaters. I mean, I would like to get everybody in the bag of your question and say, you know, I think that cultural events can, uh, are, can be safe uh, as soon as, you know, you have been told what to do, how to behave. And, you know, actually, when you think about a cultural event, you think about a mini town in which the promoter is the major. So we have very strict levels of, of controls for access, for going out, for being there, for living inside this bubble, whatever this bubble is, a theater, a cinema, or a venue. 
So actually, this cultural experience redesigned with safety values can become, again, cultural experiences. Different, of course, because it's already different in my life. I guess your life is different too right now. But it's like they can become and they will become within certain safety measures what the safety measures will allow. But meaning that your ears can still listen to music. Uh, the one thing that is almost most doubtful is the human touch. You know, the fact of being close to the other. That's the one that is mostly discussed about. In the, in the sense of virtual uh, events, I think we're still in the beginning of it. Um, I think that the virtuality of it all can become more sensorial. Uh, and again, we are going back to the fact that virtual reality and virtual events have been gone for a while, but they always and still are right now, like we are now, um, very primitive. I mean, I think that technology will offer, and very soon and possibly before, uh, let's say, end of 2021, lots of other options for us to connect. And I'm sure... And, and, and different ways, meaning in environments and ways to feel, ways to perceive, ways to connect, ways to interact. That's their job to think about it. And uh, when you have it, you know, doing something like Tomorrowland is done, it's unviable. It's non-profit making for nobody. And it's a wishful thinking for lots of people, but it's not what the promoters need to be or want to be not all of us so promoters is somebody that promotes an event or a cultural space or a cultural um, expression or experience and meaning that the promoters need to rethink what they want to promote yes how will it look how will they be uh, what's the balance is something that is still very very in the making and one thing we need to think is that needs to be profitable because if it's not profitable, it's not a music industry anymore. It's not the theater industry. It's not the cultural industry. It's just culture per se and needs to be supported by state, by governments, by institutions. The importance of the private promoter is that it's not linked with politics and it's not linked with decisions that are not made by themselves. And that's how the importance of the private promoter is. And that's why it's so important to cultivate them and make them survive. Because if not, we will yet go back to festivals promoted by states, institutions, city councils, which is a completely different concept of culture than the one the private promoters put on. Does this answer your question? Yes, it does. It's that were supposed to be happening now like in texas they're all trying to either move virtually and then you're they're not making any money off of it because you can just look at it on youtube so then i just wonder if this if we're still in the same place that we are next year how would they profit from this would they have to build their own platform and then will they charge online tickets per se for that and then what would that experience look like and then how would they compete with other festivals that might be free or whatever but well, yes, problem, was... problem with that is also the venues i mean the venues uh, there are huge venues that are empty right now and these are the part of the game too and uh you know you need to think about how this venue will survive what's the use of those venues because the venues are the very important factor of an experience a cultural experience so when you think about everything it's not that just you go online you know it's like austin and texas and south by southwest of course, you can do a South by Southwest online. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Austin as a city doesn't apply anymore. So the money that came from Austin, what is going on? What is, how do you supply that? What is going on with South by Southwest? It won't be anymore an Austin event. It will be a South by Southwest event online. So this changes the experience in lots of ways. And that's how you perceive why some promoters can jump, jump on virtual realities because it's not about a brand being virtual. We all have been virtual more or less in the last five years, 
but is also the brand associated with the offline experience and where the money came from. Just to use a text as an uh, example. <laughs> Yeah, I, li I live in Austin. And so, yeah. So you yeah. know what it is. Uh, <laughs> how you know, you know what it is, Courtney. It's been a disaster for South by Southwest this year. And, you know, uh, meaning that Austin can still produce local, but people won't travel and not at least till, you know, 2022 or something. And then you need to provoke, either you create an hyper-local scene back again, like we used to have, it's mm -hmm. not, you know, I'm sure you're young, but in my age, there was an hyper-local scene going on anyway. And then you grow again when the travels are, are allowed or are possible. Uh, but it's true that we're going local again. So, you know, uh, it means a completely different scale on budget, completely different scale on who can you invite, completely different scale on the names and the structure that we had till now. You know what I mean? So the headliners and and the whole scenarios. But I'm sure that, you know, there's one voice in the, in the cultural sector saying that th there is an important move that we still haven't seen and it's from sponsors. So uh, I, as soon as we see what the brands, uh, once they digest the crisis and the shops closure and everything, as soon as we see what the brands will do with the money, then we will, and that they reorganize the budgets, then we will see what is going on also with cultural events sponsored by virtual and non-virtual, by, by private companies. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay, I have a question now. Um, okay. I've given everyone some space. I'm trying to bring it, <laughs> bring it, back, <laughs> bring it back a bit. Um, space for my voice, yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm just going to bring it back a bit and to kind of what Katrina was talking about. And I can see this is, this is being talked about in the chat. And this is something I find um, really interesting. So we can talk about algorithms and everything, but there is still a human element in the aspect of algorithms. There's a human algorithm, so to speak. So even if we're setting up algorithms, these are still dictated by humans who are setting it up. Um, and it's then humans have also set up the internet and it's also been the same stream. This goes into what CodeUp is trying to do, CodeUp's trying to do in terms of diversifying things. But if you don't have an internet that already looks diverse, then the algorithm is following the same pattern. So the whole thing becomes an or spores, basically. Um, so my question to you is kind of, how do you work within this? I mean, you're, you're somebody who is, um, you know, like your, your expertise is in communications, like Katrina said, how do you work in terms of being in PR um, and, and fighting against, and maybe this, this, this is different in terms of how the internet works now and with algorithms. Maybe you've seen a difference from 10, 15 years ago to how it is now, but how do you work in terms of communication with the algorithms that exist in terms of our own biases now? The fact that we have polarization, the fact that people just want to hear kind of people who have the same opinions and, and they want to resonate. I mean, they, they want to you know, engage with content that resonates with them. They find it very difficult to engage with content that's different from their own voice. Um, how do you work within the biases that come from what has happened now with social media, maybe polarizing, seemingly polarizing a bit more? Um, what do you think the kind of role of PR is in trying to separate what's happened or what's happening? Well, the role of PR is supporting the language that we want to use in terms of uh, accepting that we have a strong influence in people. PR is uh, super strong. It's the major influencer. Let's say when the word influencer was invented, uh, was invented without having a license in PR. I actually have a PhD in PR. And it's like PR is a science of... Uh, influencing people by speech or by actions. And uh, I think that what, for instance, my PR is balanced in between the fact that I am part, myself, I apply my PR with myself. You know, in people that I align with on my social media, in people that I am close with, in, the, in discussions that I share, and uh, in values that I support. And uh, most, lots of people in my entourage knows about me and she said so and uh that's my strongest pr that i've done by myself on something that is not mine and uh, right now i'm doing supporting with uh, a group here that is helping feeding people and it's called health warriors and i've seen that all my friends know about that and know that i'm supporting it uh, that's the value of pr that's uh, that's your push the buttons 
repeatedly on things that you do believe of. And uh, you say to people, you know, I'm not just sonar, I'm also this person and I'm also doing this. And, uh, and you know, the value of PR is talking about it to the maximum people you can in order to diversify yourself. And I apply myself all the rules that I could apply with any pe person that I work with. Because I think that, you know, I rarely have haters. I have unfollowers, but I rarely have haters. I have a clear um, will of sharing things that are really close to my heart. And, uh, and I also think that, you know, I can't be, for instance, in the theme of race, I can't be too pushy because of what I am and what I stand for. It will be, um, from my side, it will be incoherent to, um, to, to sell you that I'm uh, completely devoted to the race cause because I'm devoted to the women cause as much as the race cause. But for me, it's all very logical. But the women cause is closer to my heart, to my heart now. So it's like I had to choose what to play with. But nobody, I don't think nobody... I don't think people that follow me uh, have felt excluded. And if they do, they would have told me because I have an open conversation online with people that actually follow me or, or chat with me or message me on LinkedIn. I answer everything I receive. And, um, and it's very important to feel the vibe of, of the things. And PR is, the, is such an important thing to contrast fake things about you or the brand or anything that is happening around you because if my ideas are clear and I'm not really polarized as a person actually this is very conflictual to me to be black and white because I can't really be black and white in a world in which I would like everything to be up there and available so it's like you know the whole influencer work is falling apart which is kind of a good thing because lots of influencers are understanding that this is not a game, this is a profession, and it's a profession that needs to have ethics and need to be analyzed from a different criteria than not just the image of it. So I think that the sustainability of PR is to professionalize it. Again, to make think that PR, it's a work that it's very, very, very tough. It's constant, you, you just, Sleep as a PR, you wake up as a PR. I wake up as a PR and I sleep as a PR because that's what I am. And, um, and that's my, also my obligation towards the world is doing things like the one that I'm doing today with you because it's a pleasure to be sharing things and knowing if I confront somebody that maybe not, not agreeing with me or maybe I see a friend like Debbie Ball here, which is my great friend that is doing amazing work. And, uh, you know, I see people that are minds alike, but I would like to be confronted by not necessarily minds alike. Uh, I read, uh, for instance, I read a lot lately about economy because some of the guys that are right, guys and girls and women and anything in between that are ri ri writing about economy are incredibly powerful because they're kind of writing about something that is kind of surreal. I don't know if it happened to you or if you've read anything about economy in the, because everything is about money right now, but there are pieces written about the status of capitalism and the questioning of capitalism that are incredibly powerful and that sells out, actually uh, referring to uh, Sophie, that kind of destroys the essence of class and the uh, barriers of class. There's a lot of discussions that are going on that are actually very close to my heart that will become more relevant even in my conversation in the future because that's where the world is going and I hope it's going I mean I'm an optimist by heart so I really believe that uh, optimism is in a way the only way to go because if not you don't see the future clearly does this answer your question Ijiro yes or not? it does it I have does. a million more questions, but... Oh, I'm my God. You can call me tomorrow. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, you exactly. can call me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> i give you an hour tomorrow, whatever the question is. <laughs> so I really need to go because my husband is waiting for dinner. And I think we've, we've passed 
the 45 minutes. Do you mind? Or we is have there any last question? Everything I think we're good. Um, so thank you. Of course, please go off and enjoy your dinner. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Georgia. It's been amazing. Thank um, you. For everyone else on the call, thank you for joining us. And also please join us for our future events. Like I said, the next one is about wine. Um, and you can go on to Eventbrite. You can go to Facebook, our Facebook page. You can also go to our Instagram and you'll see, be able to um, see the link to check out what's going on. And please also, if you're interested, this is not about anyone going to um, maybe want to who wants to code or study. Of course, if you want to do that, fine. But the whole idea of CodeUp is about building a community. Um, and we're very happy to have as many people join the community who want to kind of join this this movement and, and get interested in tech and just vibe with each other. Um, we're very happy to have you. So please go to our website, check it out, get in touch with us. Um, we'd be very pleased about that. So thank you so much. Thank you to Thank you. you, Katrina, Kodop, and everybody listening tonight. Many thanks, Georgia. Ciao. Ciao. Take care. Bye, Bye. everyone. Thank you.